And he told them amazingly, if you read John chapter 14 and John 15 and 16 together, you see, he'll say, and this is even better for you that I go. Why? Because in a, in a fuller way, we are walking with the Lord than even those who literally, physically walk with him. Isn't that amazing to think about? And that's what he's talking about here. That's what he's showing us here. And this may, amazing metaphor. Uh, that shows us our Lord who, who extended His hand to us and invited us unto Himself, has invited us to come and die to lose ourselves essentially in Him. John 15, and, I, and I would just say to you, John 15 is not really what I would call a benevolent, friendly passage in some respects. Because as peaceful and tranquil as this whole picture of a vine and the branches and the fruit may be, somebody's going to get burned here. Somebody, some, some who falsely thought they belonged are going to get cast away. And some who remain will suffer loss but will gain infinitely more than they could ever lose. That's the picture that's given to us here. And so the Lord said, I am the true vine my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then verse 3 says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now there are a couple of, 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 of action points here, if you will. The first one being this, simply to submit to what God is doing why He is doing His work in you. That's what this is showing us here. Now, what is God doing in our lives? Well, obviously, it says He is pruning us. And if you want to put another word in there that might kind of help you, or a, a, a word that would be a synonym for that, He is perfecting us. God is perfecting us. We're, we see here that, we, uh, that, that there are branches that have an outward appearance of attachment but they bear no fruit and they are taken away and burned. And that is, and, and, and to make that very clear, to make that very clear, they're cast into hell. They are separated from God for all eternity. But there are those who, and, and there are those who belong to the Lord. And, and, and the, the work that He does in them is He perfects them prunes them, He grows them up, He brings forth life in a way that they never anticipated or never could have understood. No matter how luxuriant the vine may look, no matter how beautiful the vine may be, severe steps are taken so that the vine dresser might bring forth more fruit from the branches. And that's what God is doing in your life and my life, folks. And it is so essential that we understand that in Matthew 7, Jesus said, By their fruit you will know them. And, 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 and the, this process is not about perfection, but it is about absolute, decisive direction. God is taking us somewhere. Our lives are not random. What is happening in your life right now is not random. You may not fully understand it. You may not fully grasp it. You may not understand the, the things that are happening to you, the, the suffering, the difficulties, even the good things that are taking place in your life. You may not fully understand that, but I want you to know that God our, is providential in all that He's doing. That means that God is over all this. He is at work in all of this, and He is bringing about His purposes in your life through what is happening right now. It's so important that you see that. You're not just like a feather cast to the wind. You, there is a purpose in all that God is doing in you right now. Our vine dresser, God the Father, has one desire for your life. You being a branch, if you belong to Him, you are a branch, you will always be a branch. And He has one desire to bring forth in your life, and that is more fruit. And He goes to great pains to bring about this in your life. And, every, and, he, and He cuts away everything that prevents that. Ultimately, He works to cut away 
everything that prevents that. Now, obviously, we would say, well, that means sin, right? That means the bad things in our lives or the, you know, the, the things like the bad attitudes of self-centeredness, those kinds of things, the things that are obviously bad in our lives. But even more than that, God is doing even more than that. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we kind of get a hint of this when it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now the sin, obviously, but everything that hinders. And what we find is, when we dig in a little deeper here, that sometimes even the good things in our lives, the things that we would proclaim to be positive good things in our lives, can actually end up being the very things that hinder the greatest work in our lives. And so, everything that hinders, that's what the Father, the vine dresser, is working to remove in our lives. And this process of pruning is painful, but the pain is not meaningless. And our suffering is not without purpose. Now, I'm, I'm, we're going to look at a video here. A couple, it's going to take a couple of minutes. But I want you to notice two things as the video is played. I want you to, first of all, notice what is it that the pruning is accomplishing? What is the pruning accomplishing? And, and what does the vine look like when they're done with it? I mean, observe, look at it. What does the vine look like when they're done with it? What is the pruning accomplishing? And what does this vine look like when they actually get done with it? With this vine, you're pretty much going to have to start out with thinning out cuts. Um, but the first step would be to do a rough prune where you go back and prune all these shoots back to about four to five buds, which I'll do on this one. So you do a rough prune and then you do a thinning out cut and then you'll do a fine pruning after you do the thinning out cuts. But see, this is so far up in this catch wire. I'm going to prune all the way back down to here. When you prune the vine, you're pretty much just injuring it. And so when you prune back really hard like this, it's going to trigger the vine to produce a lot more shoots. Inside this cordon will be something called latent buds. They're just kind of sitting there waiting for a reason to come out. So when I cut back on it this hard, I am probably going to trigger latent buds to come out of this vine. So we'll see some buds probably coming out here, here, here. You can see where they're most likely going to come out, but they won't come out until I prune them back this hard and injure it like this. Um, so you can see just on this one foot right here, if I left all these buds on here, um, I'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, three, four. I have about 15 to 20 shoots coming out of this one spot if I left all those on there. That'll be just way too many shoots and way too many clusters for that area. So that's why in the final prune, we go back to either one or two bud spurs, and you can even alternate that. And this part is really easy because you can just go through quickly. I'm going to take that off. And it's good just to kind of look back and see what, like John was saying with the blackberries and blueberries, just to see what you have. And did you get that? Isn't that amazing? What does she say? What, kind, what happens when you, and she used the word, injure. When you injure the thing, what happens? What comes from that? More shoots, more life. That's what the Lord is bringing forth from us. But the life can't come forth unless the vine is in, unless the branch is in. And then, what did, what did it look like when they were done with the teeth? 
It looked butchered. <laughs> it looked dead. The thing looked dead. And I don't know about you, but I've been through things in my life. And I, would, I mean, if I'm honest, and I'm just real honest about my feelings, I say, Lord, you killed me. Lord, I feel like you've destroyed me. How could how could you how could this be good? How could you do this to me? Have you ever been there? I mean, maybe it's a physical hurt, an emotional hurt, grief, lost somebody, dream unrealized. Something that you worked hard for now and it doesn't happen and it looks like it's, it's not going to happen. Something that, maybe a friend that has forsaken you, a person who betrayed you. I don't know what it was in your life. I don't, I don't know, but, but I know it hurts because I've been there. I know it hurts and sometimes... If you're just real honest about it with God, I mean, you're standing before God like the psalmist so often did. You're just saying, God, why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Would God who loves me do this to me? I mean, we feel like He, he killed me. He killed me. But what this helps us to see is in a way that we can't fully understand, we can't fully grasp. And in this process, what God is doing is bringing forth greater life. That in the injury, God is doing something that is beyond what we can ever understand. God is doing something great. And what we understand here, why, why is God doing this? Because the pruning brings forth His best in us. That God is not just full after fruit, good fruit, better fruit, but best fruit in our lives. And all we can do sometimes is just say to Job, who lost everything except a nagging wife, who told him to curse God and die, Sometimes all we can do is say to Joe, though he slay me, I will hope in him. I'll hold on to you, Lord, even though I don't understand it. It's why the Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. At least I didn't die alone, right? <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ. Who lives through me. This is what God is after in our lives, folks. This is what He is working in us. And, and pruning does not simply mean spiritual surgery that removes what is bad. It can mean cutting away the good and the better so that we might enjoy the best. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae concerning this, he, he said, And so from the day we heard about your love in the Spirit, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of, of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul, Paul's praying for them. I want you to understand what's going on. That you will, be under, that you will understand and be filled with knowledge of His will and spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. God is at work in our lives to do something amazing. All that hurts. Sometimes it just plain hurts. And I want you to understand that underneath all of this, God is not just after what is better for you, but what is ultimately best. God does not just want fruit, but more fruit. And the very best fruit. One of the videos that I watched just kind of trying to understand this whole process, they were actually pruning that this that the fruit was actually on the vine. And there are these huge clusters of fruit. 
And you think, well, that's, that's good. That's all good. You want more fruit, don't you? You want lots of fruit. But then they actually take and they pinch some of the fruit off so that the fruit that's left will be better. Not just better, but best. And that's what God's doing in our lives. Now, the word fruit in the Bible is kind of hard for us to understand. But, but I, I really believe when you kind of boil it all down, it is used to speak of supernatural character change. By supernatural, it's something only God can work in our lives. It is the character change that God desires in our lives. For in a word, it is transformation. It is character change. It is transformation. And this is what God calls us to celebrate. The change that He brings forth in this process, it doesn't always come quickly. It doesn't always, it's not a moment. But it is a process. And it is painful. And we, we see this whole idea of results in, in Galatians chapter 5 of what we call the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Did everybody here have that absolutely when you became a Christian? No. I, I, are you there yet? No. No. And if you say, yes, I am, then life will make a liar out of you somewhere, right? It has a way of doing it. But the fact is, that is what God is at work, at work doing. He's bringing about results. If you want to say it this way, the results of the Spirit. The footprints of the Spirit in your life. Paul wrote to the, the church at, at Rome, and, 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 and he, he, he spoke of desiring fruit for them. And, what he, and, and, and then he speaks of this, that, that God is doing this. Why? Well, partly we would say for our good. All things, we, we know that for those who love God, and you can say it this way, for those who abide in Christ, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. He is at work for our good, but most importantly, and superseding that always, is His glory. This is for all for His glory. Isaiah chapter 48, these amazing words from God through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, I have refined you, but as silver, or but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of what? Affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. For how should my name be profaned? For my glory, I will not give to another. God is not going to share His glory with anything else in him. And the fact is that ultimately God is at work for His glory. And, and, and here's the thing, and I want you to see this because this is so important. If God is glorified, it is for our good. If, if He, look, think about it like this. If the vine is glorified, then the branches receive benefit from that. Right? And, and it only makes sense that we would say if God is glorified, that, that it is for our good. The very highest good that we can experience is for our God to be glorified. If we belong to Him, if our lives are vitally connected to Him, then when He receives glory, it is always good for us. But the process is not easy. And I would remind you that He entered into our suffering with us. He did not stand aloft from our, and, and, and apart from our suffering, but He came into that suffering for you and for me. And God, and with God, there, you know, there, there's always a crucifixion before resurrection. And so He is at work, and sometimes it means difficulty, it means hardship. In fact, always, God wields this in our lives. In, in John 15, verse 8, we read, By this my Father, the vine dresser, is glorified, that you bear much fruit. And that bearing fruit is for His good, or for His glory, and ultimately for our good. Now, what is the, what is the knife? What is the knife that He uses in our lives? And, and the knife is, is, is shown to us in verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. 
Now we, would, we, we might say the knife is the trouble. But the trouble is the, actually the handle of the knife. But the knife is the Word. The knife is the Word. And so we submit to God's Word as you seek to understand what He is doing in your life. You have already been saved. God has already give, brought you unto Himself. He has already, in some res in one respect, positionally, He has made you right with Himself. He has made you holy. He has made you perfect. But now He is at work bringing out from you what He put into you. That's what the vine dresser does with the vine. Working out from the vine what is in the vine. Right? Working out from the branches what is in the branches. And that's what He's doing in our lives. So we submit to God's Word as we seek to understand what He is doing in our lives. The Word is the knife. Hebrews 4 says the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. The Word is the knife. In, in, in John 5, 24, we read, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. You already have eternal life. If you have, if you, if you have heard his word and believed, you have eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. The life is already there. But now he is at work bringing that life out in you. And that's what this whole process is about. Now here's the thing. Think about it like this. Without the Word, you will not understand what it is that God wants to bring forth from your life. And you will not, and you will not know how to respond. It's the Word that shows us what He's doing and how or what He wants to come out. Otherwise, we're just kind of blind in this whole thing. But God in His grace has revealed to Himself, to us in His Word, to help us to understand. Let me just give you some examples of how God helps us to understand what He's doing and what He wants to come out in our lives. 2 Corinthians 12, this passage that we're very familiar with. The Apostle Paul crying out to God. He, call, he has what he calls a thorn in the flesh. doesn't tell us what that is. Is it some emotional struggle? Is it some uh, physical struggle? Is it some... We, we don't know exactly what this is, and I think that's good because it gives us... It, we can plug in just about anything here, right? From our lives. And what does he say? A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming what? Conceited. You know, I think the, the thing that we are most likely to do in our lives is, is to be full of pride, right? Especially when things are going well. What do we do? Look what I did. To keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Lord, please take this away. But He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Boast of your weaknesses? How upside down is that in our world? I will boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And what is the call to you? The call is simply to humility. Respond with humility. We, we respond to saying, Lord, I don't understand this. I wish it would go away. I wish, I wish it would change. I would like. It's okay to pray for healing. It's okay to pray, Lord, this doesn't feel good. Take this away. We please take this away. But in the midst of all of that, what we do is simply humble ourselves under the hand of the vine dresser. We respond with humility. James chapter 1, it's very obvious what God, how God wants us to respond here. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know. Why? How can you do that? Because you know. You've been given some information about this. 
you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what God is aiming at in your life. What, how do we respond? We respond with joy. We respond with joy understanding that God has a great work to do in our lives and that He would even follow with us, right? You know, I'm telling you, the greatest judgment, the, the most awful judgment God can bring to your life is to leave you alone. But because of His grace and love, He will not leave you alone. And therefore, we respond with joy. And then another here that gives us some insight in, from 1 Peter 5, 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What a promise. He will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So what do we, how do we respond? We respond with confidence. That the one who is breaking me down will lift me up. That the one who is cutting away will bring forth more life. That is our confidence. And then how do we respond? And I think this, as a, on a corporate level, this speaks to us as God's people as a church. Well, we bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ, the law of love. In, in, in 2 Corinthians, Verse, or chapter 1, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our, our affliction. Why? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Folks, these are marching orders for us as the church. This is how we respond. We respond with ministry. Because a person who has gone through a time of pruning understands what that feels like. Like nobody else, right? And when you see somebody else going through difficulty, what do you do? You come alongside them as one who himself or herself has gone through difficulty. And together we rally to one another. You look at somebody who's going through difficulty. And yes, we pray for their healing. And yes, we pray for uh, things to change and to get better for them. But most of all, we pray, Lord, do your work in all of this. Do your work in all of this. And we will come alongside as those who comfort and those who bear one another's burdens. And so we do very practical things for each other. We provide food, maybe, in a time of grief for someone. We pray for each other. We come alongside. We don't just say we're going to pray. We pray. We, we, we maybe mow somebody's grass, you know, just to, to, to help them out in a time of struggle. We, we may clean their house. We may keep their kids. We may, I mean, just in very practical ways, what we do, we just are expressing to that person that we are helping you. We are coming alongside you to bear your burdens in this difficult time in your life. This is, this is how God works through the body. And so, how do we respond? We respond with ministry. You know, sometimes the thing that we're looking for is we're looking for some understanding of what is happening. And sometimes God shows us that very clearly. You may be going through something right now, and if you step away from it and you cry out to God, you pray, and you look for insight in God's Word, God will show you very clearly what He's trying to do in your life. But sometimes we don't always know. And Job didn't really know. Ultimately, when Job asked God the questions and he takes God to task, and he, said, he even says, and I'll argue with you, God says, I will argue my case before you. And he's talking to God, the God of the ages, the God that created all things, the God who could have snuffed him out with a breath. He's saying, Lord, I, I'm going to argue with you. And I'm looking for answers. And you know what God said? He just said, where were you? 
when I put all this in place. Who are you to come to me in the way that you're coming to me? And I know that's not emotionally satisfying to us, right? I mean, we want answers and we want them now. And sometimes we get them and sometimes we don't. But listen to what Job said when it was all said and done. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I, I just heard about you, but now I see you. Job, through all that he went through, came to know God in a way that he could never have known God through the, str the struggling and the suffering. And in all of this, Job rejoiced in the Lord. And I'm just telling you, sometimes we get a picture. This is what God is trying to say. This is why God is removing this from my life. This is why God is, is I'm going through the things that I'm going through. And sometimes we don't. But the ultimate answer is this. That God is calling us to know Him. And to know Him in depths that we can never have a man. And I will say again, in this is the grace of God. And at, at this point, at this point, one magnificent, uh, there's one magnificent thing for us. All of this points to one magnificent thing for us. And that is the possibility of change. That there could be transformation in our lives. Some of you came to Christianity and you thought, well, maybe uh, maybe by coming to Christianity, there are a couple of habits that will go by the wayside. But, but, but most of us don't really want that much change, right? I mean, change me, but not, uh, not too much. We, there are some things that we like to hold on to. There are some things that we would like to keep elevated to a place that they don't belong in our lives. There are some changes we just don't want God to make. But I'm telling you, the greatest thing that can happen to you and to me is for God to bring forth His transformation in you and in me. In 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, we read, and all, and we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the other. What is he doing? He's making us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And all I know to do is say this. Oh, the wonder that God would take me. Be glorified for me. Oh, the wonder that God would take this life that, that would be that apart from Him would be no life at all, and that He would bring forth glory for me. And as hard as that may be sometimes, and as difficult as it may be, and though there are moments in my life when I'm not really honest with God and honest with the people around me, I would have to say, Lord, it feels like you killed. I will say to Job, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. 